Hello, Online Ignite. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Miss Christine, and I'm so excited to be teaching you today. Um, it's actually the last Ignite of 2020, which is completely wild to me. Um, but we're going to continue looking at the big picture story of the Bible like we've been doing all year. And this is our first week of actually studying the New Testament instead of the Old Testament. See, we've talked about how the entire Old Testament points to the coming of Jesus. It actually points to Christmas and Easter. And I hope you have begun to realize that the Old Testament is anything but boring. It teaches us a lot about ourselves and our relationship with God. We've already learned about creation, Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, the judges, the kings, the Psalms, and the prophets. We've covered a lot of Bible and not a lot of time. But this week, we're closing up our time in the Old Testament and finding ourselves in the New Testament. See, in the Old Testament, we find over 300 prophecies or predictions about the coming Messiah, Jesus, mostly made by the prophets like Isaiah. I'll give you my favorite example from Isaiah chapter 7. It says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, God with us. So the virgin conception of Jesus, his promised arrival, the Christmas story, was predicted over 700 years by Isaiah before it even happened. It's a miracle. And guess what? It's only 12 more days until Christmas. I know, it's exciting. So I want you to pause this video and share with your group what you are most excited for this Christmas. Thanks for doing that. I love Christmas and I'm super excited for it. Even this year when everything feels really, really different. But if I'm being honest, Christmas has felt different for the past six years or so. Because six years ago, I got to go to Israel. And that's when the Christmas story actually became real to me. I got to walk around Bethlehem and see the Church of the Nativity, the spot where they actually believe Jesus was born. I got to stand on the hill where the angels appear to the shepherds. You can actually see Bethlehem from there. Oftentimes we either get bored of the Christmas story because we have heard it our entire lives, or we start to forget that it's real. We start to treat it more like a magical fairy tale instead of the miracle that it is. But this is a real story, a story that can be defended by historians and archeologists. These are real places, places that I've been. It is true that the God of the universe came from heaven and became a human baby. 100% human, who was also 100% God. He walked and talked among us, sacrificing his life, rising from the dead, all of it. All of it is real and all of it is for you. And now that we have that out of the way, I think it's time I seriously address something that has been on my mind a lot lately. Christmas is terrifying. <laughs> well, I should clarify. The way we do Christmas in America is downright scary. And I have evidence. All right, think about a mall Santa. Think about what that is. That is a stranger telling little kids to sit on his lap. The kids always look traumatized, always look traumatized, and it's really weird and creepy. Then there's a song about grandma murder. I don't know why that song gets people in the holiday spirit because that's really messed up. And then there's the other song that talks about how Santa sees you when you're sleeping and knows when you're awake. And that's the exact reason why people install home security systems. These things, these songs and these actions that we do around Christmas, they are very creepy. But for as fearful as Christmas can be, you know, I have received hundreds of Christmas cards in my lifetime and I have seen about 10,000 holiday commercials and never once have any of them said, don't be afraid. Can you imagine getting a Christmas card in the mail that had a picture of a cute little family in front of a snowman that said in big gold letters, don't be afraid, <laughs> instead of Merry Christmas? That sounds like a Halloween greeting, really creepy, but it's definitely not something that you would say around Christmas, right? We don't say, don't be afraid. We don't typically associate Christmas with the emotion of fear. We think of joy and wonder and thankfulness, but not fear. I mean, sure, there might be some anxiety mixed in there too, but not fear. We might have some worry about getting the right presents for everyone, but not fear. We have all this stress about some difficult relationships with the people we're gonna be around, but not fear. We might even have panic attacks because 
you know, we have to get so much done in so little time, but it's not fear. It's Christmas. We might dread the feelings of loneliness or disappointment we know we're going to experience after Christmas is over. And this year, we might even be afraid that we won't get to see our whole family. If we are honest with ourselves, maybe we are afraid of Christmas after all. We love Christmas, but financially, relationally, socially, and sometimes even spiritually, it can be a scary time. We can be afraid of Christmas. The exciting thing for me is that the message of Christmas, the hope of Christmas, all begins with the encouragement, do not be afraid. It's all over the scriptures. The story of Christmas begins with the reassurance that we don't need to be afraid. Tonight, we are going to see how the Christmas story began for four different people or groups of people. They were all different from all different walks of life, but God had a message for each of them and they all started the same way. Do not be afraid. The first person we're gonna look at is a guy named Zachariah. You can look up his story in Luke chapter one, verses uh, five through 13. It says this, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abaha, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now while he was serving as priest before God when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been answered, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Now, Zechariah's first response to the angel was a response of fear right? That's why the angel's uh, message to John was don't be afraid. See, Zechariah was a priest. He served God every day of his life, but he was afraid. He was a loyal husband to a godly wife, but he was still afraid of that angel. He was in the middle of a once in a lifetime honor as a priest. That's what's happening here. He was chosen out of thousands of priests to be the one to burn the incense within the temple that day. It would have been one of the highlights of his long and meaningful career, but he was afraid. Zachariah was afraid that God wasn't listening to his prayers. He was afraid that the desire to be parents would never ever be fulfilled. He was afraid that God had forgotten about him. But then an angel in verse 19 tells us that Gabriel shows up and says, do not be afraid. You see, the thing that Zachariah was afraid would never happen was about to happen. He was going to be a dad, and his son would be known as John. Which John, do you guys know? John the Baptist. John would one day let everyone know that Jesus had come into the world. He was going to have one of the most powerful and most important ministries the world had ever, ever seen. Zachariah was afraid that God wasn't answering his prayers, but he learned that God had something better prepared for him and his son than he could have ever imagined on his own. Part of the Christmas story is realizing that we don't need to be afraid if things aren't turning out like we thought, or like we hoped, or like we prayed that they would, because God may be laying the groundwork for something even greater. Now, I actually want you to pause this video, if you have time, and answer this question. Are you praying for something that hasn't happened yet? What can we learn from Zachariah's story about that? All right, the next do not be afraid is one you're probably familiar with. A little bit later in Luke 1, we read how Mary found out that she would be carrying the savior of the world. Pretty crazy, right? We're gonna look at what happened when Gabriel told her about her role in the birth of Jesus. This is in Luke chapter one, verses 26, through 33. It says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. 
for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Whew. Could you imagine being Mary in that situation? Mary was pretty much the age of the eighth graders in Ignite. It's wild to think about. Now, most people don't understand why the virgin conception is so important to our faith, or why it's a big deal if you don't believe it actually happened. But it is a big deal. Jesus had to be born of a virgin in order to be our savior. And here's what I mean. In order to be the perfect sacrifice for us on the cross, Jesus had to live a perfect life as a human. This is the only way to satisfy the requirement of the law, which demanded perfection. Jesus had to be 100% human. Therefore, he made himself flesh and was born of Mary. But he also had to be born of the Holy Spirit because Jesus is 100% God. He had to be God to save us from our sins because no human can escape original sin and live a perfect life. See, when Jesus came into the world, most of the Israelites thought they needed to be freed from Roman rule that was oppressive and unfair. But God knows that our biggest enemies are sin, death, and the devil. Those are the things that we cannot fix ourselves. We are hopeless without God's grace. He knows that our greatest need is not all the other stuff we think we need. Our greatest need is the forgiveness of our sins. That's why Jesus had to come as 100% God and 100% man. But let's think about this situation that God put Mary in. In it, Mary had a lot to be afraid of. Like I said, she was a teenage girl. She had her whole life planned out. She was engaged. And when her fiance found out, that wasn't going to go well that she was pregnant, right? On top of that, in Israel, in the first century, both her, both her betrothed, and that's basically the old-fashioned word for fiancé, had a legal right to have her executed when it became known that she was pregnant. She didn't just fear for her future marriage. She feared for her life. Joseph could have chosen to execute her. Even if she was not put to death, even if Joseph still decided to marry her, what would people say? She had a well-earned, pure reputation that was going to be very changed by this. In a matter of seconds, all that she thought her life was going to be was suddenly in jeopardy. Understandably, she had some questions. It actually says a little bit later, Mary asked the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Fair question. Ultimately, Mary chose to embrace God's plan for her life, even though it was scary. Even though it could cost her everything she had and everything that she had ever wanted. She decided that following God's will was a lot less scary than trying to do things her way apart from God's will. Look at how she responded to Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 verse 38. She says this, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. What a great attitude. See, part of the story of Christmas is realizing that we don't need to be afraid to follow, follow God's plan. When we trust God, with the course and the path of our life, we don't need to fear anything because then he's in control. Now, I want you to pause this video and talk with your small group, again, if there's time. Um, and I want you guys to share a time when something was scary and unknown in your life, but you chose to trust God anyway. Okay, so share those stories with one another. All right, so Mary was one thing, but Joseph was another. He was a good guy, but I am certain that both his pride and his feelings were destroyed by the news that Mary was pregnant. See, he would have worked and saved his entire life to be able to have a wife and eventually a family, and now he had to start all over. He had the option to publicly disgrace Mary or even have her stoned, but he decided that he was going to settle things privately and just try to find a way to get on with his life and allow Mary and her baby to get on with theirs. But then he received a visit from an angel. That's three angel visits so far, guys. So we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 through 21. It says this. 
sorry. Um, but as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Whew. Joseph's do not be afraid was a little bit different than Zachariah's and Mary's. Theirs were offered as comfort and encouragement, but Joseph's was a command. God basically told him, I know it doesn't make any sense. You don't have to understand, but you do need to obey. And look at what Joseph did. In verse 24, it says, When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Can you imagine how that conversation must have gone? They couldn't call or text, so Joseph had to walk across town over to Mary's parents' house and knock on the door. She didn't know if he was there to have her killed or to have her publicly scorned and humiliated. But then he told her, I'm still going to marry you. I'm still going to take financial or financial responsibility for you and your son. I'm going to love you and take care of you. I'm going to be obedient to God because he told me to not be afraid. Part of the story of Christmas is realizing that we don't need to be afraid to obey God, even when it doesn't make any sense. If God tells you to do something, you do it. I want you to pause this video and talk with your group. What is God calling you or our church to do and how can we do it? How can we be obedient to God? The last Do Not Be Afraid of Christmas was to a group of people who didn't get included in many stories. They weren't faithful priests like Zachariah or innocent girls like Mary or even righteous carpenters like Joseph. They were the shepherds. If you think about the Christmas story, Caesar Augustus had called for a census. A census means that everyone had to go back to the town that their families are from. But the shepherds, they just stayed where they were, out in the field. They were kind of an afterthought. The rest of society had to go take part in this census, but these guys weren't even important enough to go and be counted. They didn't seem to matter to the Roman government or really to the Jewish officials, but that didn't mean they don't matter to God. Their story starts in Luke chapter 2 verses 8 through 12. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God. This one's my favorite. I love the shepherds. They're my favorite characters in the Christmas story. Can you tell I got excited talking about them? But the angel tells the shepherds the exact same thing that Zechariah, Mary, and Joseph are told. Do not be afraid. These guys were overlooked and forgotten about by everybody, but they weren't overlooked and forgotten about by our God. My favorite part of this passage is verse 10 that says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior, which is Christ the Lord. I love that it says for unto you. It is not for unto the worthy or for unto those that don't sin or for unto the priests, innocent virgins and righteous carpenters. It was for unto you, unto you the shepherds that feel forgotten and unloved and unnoticed. If you've ever felt any of those emotions, you are the kind of people that Jesus was born for. Part of the story of Christmas is realizing that we don't need to be afraid of whether or not, you don't need to be afraid of whether or not you matter to God because you do matter to God. The good news is that Jesus came for all people and that includes you. The original season's greetings was do not be afraid. It's written all over the Christmas story. Not joy to the world or even Merry Christmas. So much of the Christmas story revolves around God letting his people know that they do not need to be afraid of anything because Jesus came and he saved us. Zachariah and Elizabeth feared from their past circumstances that told them that they couldn't have a son. 
Mary and Joseph feared for their future reputation. The shepherds simply feared for their life in the present. So whether you feel fear from your past, your present, or your future, you can find yourself somewhere in this Christmas story. We don't need to be afraid of God not answering our prayers. Maybe he's planning something bigger than our prayers or plans ever imagined. We don't need to be afraid of following God's plan because if he has given us a vision, a dream, or a calling, fear should never keep us from following it. We don't need to be afraid of being obedient to God, even, it's, even if it seems to be contrary to common sense. Because obeying what God has commanded is always the best decision. It always is. We don't need to be afraid of whether or not we matter to God because the birth of Jesus is evidence that we all matter very much to God. Fear is not an excuse this Christmas. Four times we are reminded that we have nothing to be afraid of. So what does it look like to have a Christmas without fear, even in the midst of 2020? How would you spend your time, money, and attention? I think it all goes back to what the prophet Isaiah wrote. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. We do not have to fear anything. Death, sin, or the devil are real enemies because God is with us. Because Jesus came into this world and gave us the gift of salvation. What would happen if you rested in that confidence this Christmas? How would you love people better? When you take fear out of the equation, you are free to appreciate what Christmas really is. Christmas is proof that God loves you and he has a plan and a purpose for you. I can't wait to see you in 2021. Bye guys.